Bidar is famous for the exquisite metal wear that bears its name. It is also renowned for the fabulous fort that sprawls over many hundreds of acres. In centuries before the birth of Christ, this was part of the modern empire. And subsequently, the dynasties that ruled over this territory were the Shatwahanas, the Chalukyas, the Rashtrakutas, and the Kakatiyas. The Sultan of Delhi, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, made it a part of his empire and appointed provincial governors. In course of time, they asserted their independence and founded the Bahmani dynasty. Most of the monuments that we see today within the presence of the fort were constructed then. In the medieval period, Bidar was a flourishing, prosperous town, a center of culture that impressed foreign travelers like Farishta and Afan Sain Nikitin. Built on a fertile plateau in the Deccan, Bidar Fort in Karnataka is about 135 kilometers from Hyderabad. It was built in the first quarter of the 15th century by Sultan Ahmad Shah Wali, who transferred his capital from Gulbarga to Bidar. This place was considered better protected from invasions. Bidar really was the crucible of how Deccan Sultanate life in the region because it was where the Sultan settled after moving the capital from Gulbarga and there began to be a flourishing of the arts. Um, also the whole systems of administration, of uh, statecraft, all developed and were refined in Bidar. The building of this fort that took 100 years to complete bears testimony to the ambitions of the Bahmanis. With the ascendancy of the Bahmanis in Bidar, the influence of the Tughlaq Sultans of Delhi was wiped out from the Deccan. Iranian and Central Asian influence increased in the cultural life of the region. After the Bahmanis, their viziers became the rulers and founded the Barid Shahi dynasty that reigned for almost 200 years till they were vanquished by Aurangzeb. most significant role in the fort's defences was played by nature. The fort is built on the highest point on the sprawling plateau. Ramparts on the outer periphery have walls 15 metres thick. A deep moat cut in the rock runs along the ramparts. There are 37 towers where large guns were placed to deter the enemy. It was almost impossible to cross the moat and these walls and enter the fort. In times of war, the moat was filled with water and the wooden drawbridges were raised.
bigger for for me is a series of variety of experiences so you see these gates you are been ceremonious highway you you your ego of that visitor is really been pampered you know you are really feel something that bhai hum kuch hai hum jab when you are as a common man even if you go tomorrow you feel that you have been royal welcome there There are seven large gates, three in a row, that provide access to the interior space. Sharja Darwaza is the main entrance. It is decorated with beautiful windows, and the outer walls have blue and green tiles. This gate shows that despite this being a military structure. The cosmetic aspect wasn't overlooked. The entrance appears to welcome the visitors. A broad winding path connects it with the Gumbad Darwaza. The Gumbad Darwaza is 45 feet tall and has walls 22 feet thick. It is said that 3000 soldiers were deployed between these two doors to guard the fort. the style of architecture they use local material which has laterite beautiful laterite and red bricks so it was gelling almost with the same plateau of red color bidar ki khasiyat hai hum to bachpan mein bolte the yaar bidar ko ja ke aaya to pura safed shirt lal hota tha hamara the landscape is green and red Bidar Fort demonstrates amazing diversity of architectural styles. The main citadel and fortification of the city are meticulously planned. One encounters royal palaces and mosques in the main fort. The madrasa and bazaars were built within the ramparts. Engineers and builders were called from different parts of India as well as foreign lands. This is the reason why one sees Iranian and Turkish influence in many buildings here. All the buildings are tastefully decorated. At some places fine stone carvings enchant us at others the same magical effect is created by carved wood wherever you stand there is a refreshing sense of open space be it a palace or a mosque Many structures have turned into ruins. Yet the fort is well worth a visit. I think they wanted to create that kind of a developed system of architectural perceptions. it's almost like expressionist ex style of working so you have create trying to give the buildings views in perspectives you have a feast of variety of perspectives the moment you enter the main gate is at an in inclination it's a great perspective the construction of the fort at bidar is inspired by the iranian concept of qila ark in which the royal family stays protected by the royal guards in an impregnable citadel and the rest of the population dwells in an equally well designed city beautifully fortified the iranian influence is most resplendent at rangin mahal where the walls are decorated with multicolored tiles
creating an illusion that they have been draped in expensive Persian carpets. The Rangin Mahal is sighted the moment you pass through the Gumbad Darwaza. The outer walls of this palace have colorful tiles, justifying its name. Originally commissioned by the Bamani rulers, it was rebuilt by Ahmad Shah Barid in the middle of the 16th century. On the walls was done at this time. Colored paintings on its walls create a magical atmosphere. The palace is decorated with carved wooden pillars. These wooden pillars in the courtyard and galleries remind one of Hindu and Jain temples. The palace is built in wood, as is the tradition in, in Maratha architecture, in this incredible brick fortification. So in amongst this very solid fort is this perfectly crafted, very refined wooden Maratha palace with Ottoman-style paintings. And it in many ways reflects the multiple cultures that were brought into Bidar. Iranian architecture and town planning assign an important place to landscaped gardens. Following this tradition, many of the buildings are arranged around the rectangular Lal Bagh. What kind of the cultural know-how these people, cultural background these people must, because architecture just cannot take place like this. It's just we want to have a lot of money, you have a lot of place and power and you want to do good architecture, it doesn't happen. You must be culturally very rich. The Sola Khamba Masjid was built 100 years before the capital was shifted to Bidar. Built by the Tughlaq Sultans, it is considered the oldest mosque in southern India. This was where namaz was offered on Juma. This was also the venue where the Bahmani and Barit Shahi rulers participated in formal celebrations. With their rich cultural background, they have created wonderful architecture and they have adorned that architecture with a great respect of light that is coming from the top. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, gift of the nature, that natural light you can really bring in inside the buildings with such a due respect. Tarkash Mahal is a multi-storied building built largely by two Bahmani sultans, Ahmad Shah III and Muhammad Shah III. The task of repairing and rebuilding it was taken up by their Barid Shahi successors. They had come from Turkey and perhaps this is why it was given this name. Numerous alcoves on its walls serve as a unique decorative design.
On the upper story, there is a large gate with an arch and a number of arched windows and skylights to provide fresh air and light. It was Ahmad Shah Alwali who shifted the capital of the Bahmanis from Gulbarga to be there. The city became famous not only as the political capital of the Bahmanis but also the cradle of a composite civilization of Deccan. Here in the fort of Bidar, we come across many monuments that have a clear imprint of the Hindu Kakatiya period. Symbols like lotus abound. Ahmad Shah Alwali, a patron of Sufi saint, was himself revered by his people as a peer. Takht Mahal is reckoned among the oldest structures in the fort. It has a large courtyard to the front. A grand gate was built for the entrance. Today, this palace is totally ruined. But the surviving arch bears testimony to the lofty conception of the architect. On one side are the remains of rooms for the royal family and on the other side the hall that served as the Divane Khas. Within this compound, a beautiful round pond of water was built, along with a double-storied hammam. Historians opine that this beautiful palace was destroyed in an explosive conflagration during warfare. You can just imagine, being a person in the architecture field, you can immediately imagine, my God, what cultural richness these people must be having. The romance of Arabian Nights was actually lived in Bidar Fort once upon a time. The Divane Arm is another important building in the fort. The Sultans gave audience to their subjects here. Accounts of foreign travellers tell us that the famous throne, Takhte Feroza, was kept here. According to Firishta, no other throne in the world matched it in opulence and artistry. The Divani arm was decorated in a unique manner. Its walls were adorned with colored tiles that created the illusion of bound books. Only a single wall survives today. The rest have crumbled. There is one name in the history of Bidar that is absolutely unforgettable, and that is the name of Mahmud Gawan. Mahmud came from Gilan to be there at the age of about 45 to visit some Sufi saints who dwelt here. He so impressed the Sultan with his talents that he was immediately appointed the Wazir. He served not one, not two, but three Sultans in succession. He was a man of many parts, a truly Renaissance man, a mathematician, a poet, a very brave soldier and an efficient administrator. He rose quickly through the ranks. His progress made his fellow courtiers very envious and they conspired to bring about his downfall. They implicated him in a false case of forgery and persuaded the Sultan to order his execution. Muhammad 
Yakshgan is the folk art form of Karnataka. In this performance, the tragic tale of Mahmud Gawa is depicted. Gawa served as Prime Minister to three Sultans of Bidar. That was the time when a fierce conflict raged between the native Deccani and the foreign Afki factions in the court. Mehmud became a victim of this and fell prey to a foul conspiracy. The Sultan ordered the execution of his once trusted minister and the decline of Bidar started thereafter. Mahmud's great desire was to establish in Bidar a world-class university and he established an Islamic madrasa here that soon became famous as a centre for the study of Islamic theology. Mahmud wanted to make the institution truly international and world-class and he entered into correspondence with all the leading Islamic scholars of his time sitting in Bidar. <laughs> The Madrasa at Bidar was built by Mahmud Gawa. This was a residential institution with hundreds of students and dozens of teachers. This seat of learning was free from sectarian dogmatism and was internationally renowned for encouraging a pluralistic, humane outlook. Engineers and craftsmen were invited from Iran to build this madrasa. Here, one can see a clear reflection of the buildings in Isfahan and Samarkand. Bidar Fort was never merely a military building. It was a seat of learning and culture. It is not easy to answer how and why the decline started. Rival factions in the court and the arrogance of some sultans certainly invited ruin. History never forgives hubris and lapses. If these stones had a voice, this lesson would be heard loud and clear.